of the many remarkable things happening in the Great Plains in the late 1800s. One was the discovery of fossils that proved the interior of the United States had once been covered by a sea. The work of one family and one man in particular was pivotal in understanding our landscape's ancient past. So Western Kansas in the late 1850s and early to mid 1860s was being well known because there were a lot of military engagements out here. And so the military people, especially the post-surgeons and some of the doctors, were, had scientific training. So that brought the Western third of the state into light on what was really here. And they were finding fossils. Hi, my name is Ian Trevethan. I am the education director here at the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. When you talk about the Sternberg family in terms of impact on the Western United States and science, I think as we know it, it starts in Kansas and it starts post-Civil War. Trying to figure out the Sternberg lineage does get confusing because the Sternbergs tend to name each other after one another. So you have multiple Charleses, you have multiple Georges, and actually you have multiple Levi's. The best way to discern who you're talking about is to use their middle names. So it starts with a guy called George Miller Sternberg, who was a medical doctor, uh, and he was posted at several forts around the Western interior uh, after the Civil War. Dr. Sternberg was stationed at Fort Harker, which is or was located uh, in what is now Canopolis, Kansas in Ellsworth County. One of the interesting things is is post-doctors, and that's all of Sternberg's contemporaries at this time, in addition to dispensing medical duties on post, which is taking care of soldiers, doctoring. Once those duties were done, their next primary duty was to sort of take stock of what natural resources were around. So that includes looking at plants, looking at animals and cataloging those things, looking at the geology and those kinds of resources. Uh, as well as uh, meteorological data. So George Miller Sternberg is now stationed at where Canopolis, Kansas is now. He was credited as actually being some of the, uh, one of the first people to find some of the earliest vertebrate fossils. So he, he found some of the first fish fossils, some of the first uh, marine reptile fossils in this area. He, he had some tumultuous times. He, uh, he was stationed there through a, uh, an epidemic of cholera uh, during which he lost his wife. Um, so it was pretty tough going for him, but he apparently liked the area enough that he bought a plot of land and talked his father and several of his siblings into moving from New York uh, to start a ranch in Kansas in Ellsworth County. Uh, so that's really where the first chapter of the Sternbergs start. One of those siblings was his younger brother, Charles. Now, Charles Sternberg is really, I think, the first fossil collector, I think, that, that scholars tend to focus on. He was very, very prolific, uh, but he would not have gone on that route, I think, were it not for his brother. Uh, he went on to uh, work for both uh, O.C. Marsh and E.D. Cope. Uh, he worked with both of those guys. So Marsh and Cope were, were the sort of prominent paleontologists and anatomists of their time, of the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, and they are famous for what is known as the Bone Wars, which is this competition between two contemporaries to find and name the most greatest, grandest fossil specimens coming out of the Western interior of the United States. They went on to sort of have what is equivalent to a feud where you have these two camps moving across the Western United States, basically sniping with each other over the best fossil finds. So there's a lot of sort of skullduggery happening. Uh, but in spite of that, that's what's interesting about Charles Sternberg is he managed to work with both, with both camps and learn what he needed to learn and sort of rise above that. Charles Sternberg then just goes on to sort of be the prolific 
fossil hunter of his time. And eventually he had three sons. And this is where it gets confusing. So you have multiple Charleses, you have multiple Georges. George Fryer Sternberg is who would eventually become the curator of our institution here. So you've got basically two generations worth of fossil finders and describers. As far as the Sternberg family goes, they weren't formally trained, but they were still well regarded. You'd be hard pressed to walk into a museum, natural history museum in North America, probably the world, and not find some fossil that was found and delivered by one of the Sternbergs. So George Fryer was hired by what would eventually become uh, Fort Hayes State University to basically start and, and manage a fossil collection for study and display at the university. Uh, and much of what's on display around here, around our, our main fossil gallery, are specimens that were, were excavated and prepped out by George Sternberg himself. In his time, um, he collected many, many fossil specimens for many, many different institutions. For us, I think the most prominent fossil that's on display here is a fossil called the fish within a fish, which is a large fish called a Xyphactinus, and inside of its gut is a smaller fish called a Gillicus, and it's very, very well preserved. We get inquiries about it from all over the, all, all over the world. The history of that fossil is very interesting. It was discovered in the spring of 1952 uh, by a field crew from, I believe it was the American Museum of Natural History. It was then later excavated by Sternberg during the summer of 1952. We've got a large mosasaur called a Tylosaurus. Um, the one that's on display in our main fossil gallery is about 30 feet long. They did get bigger. Uh, one of the other interesting specimens is an animal called Megacephalosaurus. Uh, Megacephalosaurus is a larger bodied, short necked plesiosaur. Megacephalosaurus literally means large headed reptile. And it's, if, if I were to stand its skull up um, from top to bottom and stand up, I would be about as tall as the skull. It's about six feet long. Uh, in terms of the Sternbergs and the, and the fossil finding aspect, and even the bone wars, what makes this area so unique is Kansas contains one of the best continuous sections of the Western Interior Seaway that existed in the late Cretaceous. So where you've got a very, very unique feature in terms of an ocean that is sitting on top of a continent. So you get this really, really well-preserved record that unique feature of ancient Kansas continues to drive the research work of the Sternberg Museum today. My name is Dr. Ali Baumgartner and I am the Paleontology Collections Manager here at the Sternberg Museum. The way the collection here works is we do have some things that are really targeted, you know, a specific locality that we're continu continuing to excavate, but the vast majority of our collection is actually just landowners contacting us, hey, I found a thing are you interested? And then we will see if it's worth exploring. And that's really fun. You know, kind of really building on to that Sternberg legacy. You know, Sternberg was working with Kansans, right? He was talking to people. He had this good relationship with the community. People have been coming to the museum, you know, as children and they're excited to be able to bring the things that they have found so that they can bring their grandchildren to say, hey, grandpa found that. Like, I love when people contact me to say, my great grandpa donated something to the museum. Do you still have it? And the answer is typically yes. And so I'll bring them in and show them, yes, this is the mammoth tooth that your great grandpa collected. Throughout time, Kansas has, been, has historically been exceedingly interesting. So the fact that, you know, the Western Interior Seaway, there used to be an ocean over Kansas, this inland sea that's full of all these sea monsters. And then as you continue on, you have this period of time when Kansas was covered with basically a rainforest. Like, this is amazing. You continue on and you have this expansion of the grasslands that you see today, but not with the animals that you would expect to see today. There were rhinos, there were elephant relatives. It's amazing. If you were to take a time machine and stand right here in Hayes and go back in time, 
There would be mammoths in Kansas. There would be rhinos in Kansas. There would be saber-toothed cats in Kansas. And then at one point you'd be underwater and you'd be in trouble. But it's really cool just to think that we have history in our backyard here and it's amazing. This is one of my favorite specimens in the museum. So this is Ectenosaurus clydostoides. It is a relatively small um, mosasaur from the Western Interior Seaway. Um, it's actually very rare. George Sternberg was working with a museum in Germany and he excavated an Ectenosaurus. Um, it is the holotype, so the specimen that the species was named for, and it was taken to Germany. And then a handful of years later, George was excavating in the same area and found another one, a better one. So during World War II, the museum with the holotype in Germany was bombed. And so that was lost. And so this uh, very recently was assigned a neotype. So neotype means that it is the new type. It is the replacement for the holotype that was lost. Um, which is very exciting for us. It's actually more complete than the holotype was. We have basically an entire skull um, and the front half of the animal. There's also skin impressions, which you don't get very often. And so people come to, to, uh, to study it pretty frequently. Let's go over there. Um, so if you want, you can follow me this way. I want to show you a drawer of rhino toes. I swear it's more interesting than it sounds so, like. So this is one of my favorite random drawers in the collection. I love bringing people over here to see this. Oftentimes when you're doing vertebrate paleontology, you are at the whims of erosion, right? So vertebrate paleontology prospecting involves a lot of like staring at your feet, hoping that you're going to recognize a bone. But sometimes we get lucky and we work in quarries. And when you're in a quarry, you already have a pretty good sense of the edges and you can just dig down. But when you're in a quarry, you find a whole lot more material and you can start organizing it by element. So all of these cabinets have rhino material and all of the toes ended up in here. But once you have this sort of um, volume of information, then you can start doing, asking interesting kinds of questions. Like how many rhinos were there? Based on how many toes, what does that mean for how many rhinos there are? And also, what's the variation in size of these rhino toes? It gives us a sense of the variation in size of the rhino. So even just a drawer of rhino toes can give us so many answers to questions about the past of Kansas. Who knew? I love to tell the story of how I met <laughs> this fossil. Um, so my first week as a paleontology collections manager, my job is to know where everything is. And so the first week, I was like, I should just start opening drawers to see what's in here. I opened this drawer and came face to face with a fish face. I love this fossil. I show it to as many people as I can. It's actually the holotype of Beninogmius elephensis. I really enjoy fossils like this one that take no imagination. You look at this and you know exactly what this fish looked like, at least the face part, because you can see the eyes and the mouth. If I show you a rhino toe, it might be kind of hard to easily extrapolate that into the rest of a rhino, unless you've already seen a rhino. But look, looking at a face like that, I know exactly what you look like. One of the things I really like about our collection is how many random skulls we have out so that I can always illustrate what I'm talking about. I like to bring students over and point at things. This is a brontothere, uh, previously identified as Menops, now it's Megacerops. Brontothere means thunder beast, which is one of those fantastic names that you get in paleontology because they're built a lot like rhinos or um, maybe hippos, but they have very small little teeth. So they lived during the Eocene, but that's before the spread of grasses in North America. So they didn't have the big old teeth that you would need to be able to grind up grasses. Instead, they have these really adorable small teeth um, because they're eating softer foods. Through time, we then see the rise and spread of rhinos in North America. So we definitely don't have native rhino here, rhinos here today, 
but they used to be everywhere in like the Miocene. Uh, this is an example of Teleoceros, which was basically the pot-bellied rhino. They weren't very tall, they had pretty stocky legs. They also didn't have horns. So in many ways, their body shape is more like a hippo than you would expect of a rhino today. So they have these big old, uh, big old teeth for fighting. They also have much taller teeth. The reason for that is by the time rhinos come around, we do have that expansion of grasslands. And so they need these taller teeth to be able to grind up grass. So first we had our brontotheres, then we moved on to rhinos, and then even later on we had proboscideans. So this one is actually from about the same time period as our friend the rhino. So these are tusks. This is actually one of our holotypes, and it is from a mud-grubbing mastodon. So the reason it's called that is because it had these very long lower tusks in addition to its top tusks. But proboscideans of all kinds are very common in Kansas in the fossil record. Now, we don't have any, but in the Miocene, we had these different types of, of mastodon friends. Um, during the Pleistocene, during the Ice Age, we would have mammoths. So the fact that we don't have proboscideans or mammoth relatives in Kansas today is actually more surprising than the fact that we had them previously because we had them for longer than we haven't. The Sternberg family were basically just people who found cool rocks and wanted to see how far the rabbit hole went. You know, they were not necessarily trained in this. And that is something that literally anyone can still do today. You can still go back. The Sternberg family, you know, I feel like is a really good illustration of the fact that anyone can do this. They, it was a family thing. They just passed it on to each other, but they also got their community involved. Like, I genuinely think that part of the reason we have such this um, positive relationship between paleontology and Western Kansas is because of the Sternberg family being really welcoming to their neighbors and helping them find things, helping them excavate things and promising we will preserve this forever so your family can see it too. And I think it's fun that people can be a part of that. That continued work of connecting people with the past is a central part of the Sternberg Museum. Welcome to the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. I'm Dr. Reese Barrick, and I'm the director of the museum. And our mission is to really uh, advance an understanding and an appreciation of natural history. We really focus on the Great Plains, and we've got an abundance of natural history. We're a center of, of herpetology, snakes and turtles and lizards, and we've got all of the fossils of the Western Interior Seaway. So it's just an amazing abundance of diversity of natural history. We do a lot of fun things at the, the Sternberg Museum, and a lot of it really does tie back to George and how he built the museum, but extending to how we can keep the excitement going for paleontology. One of those things is that we offer summer camps here at the Sternberg, and these summer camps are often centered around going out in the field with high school students or middle school students and teaching them how to do field work and excavate fossils. Um, so we have a lot of kids every, from all over, the, all over the world and a lot of Kansas kids learning about Kansas paleontology um, and digging up fossils and that's where a lot of our fossils um, that we are getting in the collection these days is from our summer camps. We also like to uh, put our fossils into new and interesting exhibits. One of the things that is fun about fossils is that they relate to living animals. So we have an exhibit here where I'm standing in front of which is called Bringing Fossils to Life, where we show off a lot of the fossils that we have um, and we tie them to modern animals and talk about what are the connections. Next to me here, we've got uh, Mosasaur. Um, and Mosasaurs are fascinating creatures. They look like these giant lizards and they look like really kind of like giant Komodo dragons, except that they lived in the ocean and swam around. Interestingly enough, a lot of early paleontologists thought they were most closely related to snakes. They were in a group called Pythonomorpha. These giant uh, mosasaurs had a second row of teeth down the middle of their jaws, just like pythons. But everything else about these guys looks like a monitor lizard. So we have our monitor lizards over here. We have Australian water monitors. And water monitors are cool because they have a, a keel on their tail that helps them swim. They spend a lot of time in the water. Mosasaurs had a big keel on their tail to help them swim through the ocean. 
but we got some really cool tortoises. We had giant tortoises in, in North America. We've got the fossils of them. You know, tortoises haven't changed a lot through time. When you have a really cool evolutionary innovation, like a shell that protects you from everything, then there's not a lot of other changes it needs. It's a really successful thing. And so we have examples of all of this from the fossil record here in Kansas, and we can tie it to animals from all over the world. And that really gives us some cool context globally with a center on Kansas. And that's kind of what George always wanted. He wanted a lot of his fossils in the schools around Kansas because he wanted kids to have the opportunity to see fossils and think about them as real animals living at different times and how those connections are made to the present. The Sternbergs were a very, very unique group of people because they seem to be very socially conscious people as well as very interested in the natural world. Um, and, and I think they were sort of civically minded as well. You know, so to me, it's sort of a template of the kind of citizens we should sort of strive to be in our own lives. I love that we have the connection of Dr. Sternberg here in Kansas because he is an example of your everyman paleontologist. Like definitely, when you think about like the bone wars and things like that, you have this perception of the gentleman naturalist, the, the you know, buttoned up paleontologist who's really actually sending you know, locals out into the field. And that was very much not the Sternberg family, <laughs> uh, any of them, because there was a whole family of paleontologists. And I, I think that's really valuable, that having this relationship between um, the people and the past. Any one of the Sternbergs, I think they had a very positive effect on their community. I think they were driven by multiple things. Um, I think they were definitely faith driven. I think they were curiosity driven. It's fascinating to see the ways that paleontology has kind of evolved through time. That historically you do have these, you know, men of science who are doctors, lawyers, whatever. They're here to do one thing. But, you know, I'm not going to ignore <laughs> the, the rocks that are on the ground. And I do think it's really interesting because when I'm reading the correspondence, when I'm reading what people had you know, written in their diaries historically, they, they are in the past, so they didn't have our hindsight. And it's interesting because I don't think they realized how much they were changing our understanding of the world. Often I think in life, you have to make choices of what you want to do with your life, right? And one of the best chunks of advice I got was from my mom, who always told me to do what you are. And to me, the Sternbergs were a really, really great example of just doing what you are, being what you are. Reading uh, Charles Hazelius's autobiography, it just seemed like, you know, he tried for a while to sort of do the ranching thing, to try to help get his family established. But he was compelled to go out there and find fossils. And I think that that, is fantastic. So having that legacy as part of the museum is incredibly valuable. That means that, you know, in order to really honor the Sternberg name, we should be continuing and forging these relationships with our community because we wouldn't, we literally wouldn't have a museum without relationships with local landowners. You know, George wouldn't have been able to get the stuff. We wouldn't have, uh, we wouldn't have it now and it wouldn't continue on in the future and so having that really good relationship with your neighbors is how we're going to continue on in the future.